A crew of space marines is sent to a space station on one of the most dangerous moons in the solar system. But upon arriving at the place, they find a more terrifying discovery that makes them wish to never come back there again. How many of the crew will be able to survive? Let's find out in the movie. Scientists from United Aerospace Corporation, commonly known as UAC, discovered ancient teleportation machines in Nevada on Earth and Phobos, one of Mars's moons. These machines are later on called gates, and to study them more carefully, UAC built their bases of operations around them. And now, they are finally going to experiment and use it for the first time. A volunteer from the Nevada facility will go through the gates and will be supposedly teleported to the Phobos facility. Upon the activation of the gates, the volunteer nervously steps inside and just seconds after, he is now in Phobos facility. At first, everyone rejoices for what seems to be a scientific breakthrough. But to their surprise, what arrives in the facility is a pale-looking man with sharp claws and teeth. Meanwhile, on a UAC armored transport vessel called the NOLA, a crew of space marines is awakened from cryosleep. As a lieutenant named Joan Dark wakes up, she shortly dreams about her mother's passing. The ship's pilot, Morgan, greets the crew on their waking up. The crew consists of Captain Savage, Joan, Tarek, Winslow, Carly, Rance, Lee, Harry, and Aqua. Tagging along with them is a scientist and Joan's ex-boyfriend, Dr. Bennett. In the cafeteria, the crew, except the captain and Joan, sits and eats together while talking. But when Joan shows up, the crew awkwardly falls silent. Tarek points out that it's time for the briefing, so everyone takes off, leaving Joan and Bennett in the cafeteria. Bennett congratulates Joan for being promoted to lieutenant. In turn, she asks if Bennett had been to Phobos before, to which he says no. Speaking of the Phobos facility, the volunteer is now in isolation as he shows aggressive behavior. After running the analysis on the man, Dr. Malcolm Betruger, the lead scientist in Phobos facility, discovers antidepressants in the man's system. He tells Dr. Ahmed Khan, the lead scientist of the Nevada facility, that it might be the reason why the volunteer turns out like that after the teleportation. However, this should not stop them from continuing the testing of the gates. Hearing this, Khan is worried about the board, saying that they will not allow another test until the recent issue is solved. But Truger just says they should never let one setback distract them. What is important is that they have successfully teleported a man from Nevada to Phobos in an instant. Also, Betruger assures Khan that there's no need to worry about finding a new volunteer since he will be the one to undergo the test next. Going back to the NOLA, the crew starts their briefing, led by Captain Savage. According to him, the Phobos facility built into the Martian moon was divided into three levels. They have a cargo bay, offices, living quarters, and other basic stuff at level 1, while the computer and maintenance sections are located at level 2. The laboratories and a fusion reactor are then located on level 3. The crew is surprised to learn that the facility is using nuclear power, yet Bennett assures them that the reactor is safe. What they need to worry about is the moon itself because it has one of the most unstable environments in the solar system. That is why Phobos is called the Doomed Moon. This information triggers Winslow and asks why they are sent to Phobos when only one of them messed up during their last mission. Joan knows he's referring to her and asks him to address her directly. As it turns out, Joan was punished for insubordination because of what she had done just recently. But instead of her getting punished alone, her whole crew gets dragged into the mess. That is why the crew is distant to her and now Winslow is blaming her for bringing all of them to the doomed moon. Savage orders Winslow to stop, saying that as a crew, they will either succeed or fail together. He then dismisses the team and tells them to prepare themselves for landing. The scene then changes to Phobos' facility, where Betruger is being prepared for his travel to the gates. The one who runs the scan on him is new medical personnel named Veronica. Betruger comforts her, advising her not to be nervous. When the gates are activated, he doesn't hesitate to step inside. However, a massive power surge happens, causing a blackout in the whole facility. Veronica sees a wounded person and goes to get the first aid kit. 
At that moment, she hears a growling noise behind her. Veronica screams when turning back to see what causes the noise. After a while, the Nola arrives and docks into the facility's landing pad. Morgan tries to initiate contact with the facility's tower to request entry, but no one answers him. After another failed attempt, he orders Daisy, the ship's AI, to establish communication with the facility's tower. Savage arrives shortly after, and Morgan explains to him the situation. But even Daisy cannot get into their system. Just then, she receives an incoming message from the Martian Command. Listening to it, Martian Command orders them to hold their positions for a while. Because of this, Savage calls Joan and Bennett and informs them of what is happening. Bennett then remembers from what he read about the facility that there is an entrance built into the landing pad. Using the camera underneath the NOLA, he shows them what he's talking about. They receive another call from Martian Command, and Savage tells them they already found a way to enter the lab. Hearing this, the Martian Command then gives them their mission briefing. After that, the crew gathers to discuss their mission. According to Savage, the facility system went offline about 20 minutes ago. Their new mission now is to enter the facility to get its system back online. Tarek asks why they need to do that. Bennett answers him, saying that there are experiments inside the facility that are at extremely high risk that require precise monitoring. If they don't manage to get the systems back online, these experiments, plus the years of work and progress of the scientists, will be meaningless. Savage then continues and makes the team listen to the last distress signal sent by the facility before they went offline. And to the crew's horror, all they hear are growling and screaming. Winslow asks what hell has happened, and Savage only knows that they are not simply dealing with a blown fuse. After Savage dismisses the crew, he talks to Morgan about their evacuation plan just in case something went wrong. The pilot then assures the captain that once the situation requires, the NOLA will be able to instantly escape the moon. Meanwhile, as the crew gears up, Winslow points out that they can be dealing with aliens right now. However, Tarek argues that there has never been any recorded evidence of extraterrestrial life throughout history. When everybody is ready, Morgan deploys the extension bridge to the hatch underneath the landing pad. But as soon as the NOLA connects to the facility, the power of the ship gets corrupted and shuts down for a while. Luckily, the power gets back on immediately. The crew then manages to enter the facility without a problem. Upon checking the oxygen, gravity, and toxicity level of the facility, everything seems fine. Yet, when Bennett checks on the power reserve of the place, he discovers that there's only 2% power left. He informs Joan about it, and she says he must tell the captain. As they enter the hallway, Bennett does what Joan suggests and adds that this only gives them 90 minutes to finish their mission. Furthermore, turning the systems back online is useless unless they can restore power. Without the power, the safeguard against the core meltdown will fail. If that happens, they will not only lose the facility, but the whole moon and their lives as well due to the explosion. Because of that, Savage decides to split the crew into two groups. He, Rance, Carly, and Aqua will go with Bennett to the reactor, while Joan will lead Tarek, Winslow, Lee, and Harry in finding the server. There, they will wait for Savage's signal to see if the system can be turned back on or if they have to retreat. With things all set up, everyone moves out. Using the map Daisy provides them in a heads-up display, the two groups go their separate ways on levels 2 and 3 of the facility. At level 2, Joan and her teams find a headless corpse lying around. She reports the body to Savage right away. Upon checking on the ID, Joan discovers that the man was a UAC Marine. Nearby, Tarek sees blood writings on the walls and says they may be from the Sumerians. In order to translate the writings, Joan asks for Daisy's help. According to whom, the writing says someone is going to reclaim what is rightfully theirs, even if it means there will be killing and no one will escape. Hearing this, Joan asks Savage what they will do, to which Savage decides that they should continue. Back in the NOLA, as Morgan goes to get himself a drink, he doesn't notice that something hacks Daisy and starts altering the navigation path of the crew. Then all of a sudden, the writings on the computer briefly turn into Sumerian. Because of this, both teams are starting to get lost inside the facility. Joan orders Daisy to repin the server, but something is going on with the AI. 
back to the NOLA, where Morgan is trying to contact the crew but keeps on failing. Left with no other choice, the pilot decides to fly up to orbit in hopes of getting a better signal on Mars. But to his surprise, Daisy tells him that she won't let him leave. And as if being possessed, Daisy starts sounding like a demon, and the engine suddenly shuts down. Just then, Morgan hears something growling behind his chair. When he looks back, he sees a terrifying alien. Having lost Daisy's help, Joan decides to look for the server themselves. While doing so, Lee notices someone running behind them. She goes to search for the possible survivor, and Harry accompanies her. Tarek, on the other hand, finds someone sulking in the corner. After notifying Joan, he goes to check on it, only to discover that it's a man who's eating another person. And to his shock, he doesn't manage to evade the attack of the zombie-like creature, and it rips Tarek's throat out. When Winslow finds him, it's already too late and the zombie attacks him too. Winslow struggles and kills the zombie by shooting it in the head. Joan arrives shortly after and sees what happened to her crewmates. At the same time, Savage's team also detects people nearby and checks on them. Lucky for them, these are actual survivors. A female scientist, Veronica, and the facility's chaplain, Glover. Hearing a gunshot on the radio, Savage asks Tarek what's going on. But to his surprise, Joan is the one who answers and says that a zombie-like creature has attacked and killed Tarek. At that moment, Lee and Harry join the conversation and report that the captain that the two of them were attacked by a zombie earlier as well and had taken it out. Joan checks on the zombie and sees that it's a geneticist in UAC. Lee inspects the zombie on their side to see if it's also from UAC, but it suddenly attacks her. Acting quickly, Harry finally kills it this time before it can do any harm to Lee. As if all hell breaks loose, Savage's team gets attacked by zombies just now, and the female scientist is the first one to go down. To make matters worse, Daisy deactivates their communication lines. More zombies then appear, and the Marines struggle to fight them as they are heavily outnumbered, causing the life of Lee and Aqua. Going back to level 2, Winslow leaves Joan when his cowardice takes over him. Because of that, Joan is left alone to fend off the zombies. After some time, Winslow, who is running away from zombies, comes across Joan again. She doesn't hesitate to save him, but still smacks him afterward for leaving her. Somewhere, Harry is looking for his crew when he stumbles upon a barely surviving scientist who turns out to be Betruger. In the end, Savage, Aqua, and Lee die during the struggle, with Savage sacrificing himself for the crew. Watching the captain die right in front of her, Joan confronts Bennett about what is truly happening. At this moment, Bennett reveals that the Phobos scientists discovered evidence of alien life. Joan asks what this evidence is, and Betruger suddenly shows up with Harry, saying that it's the kind of evidence that is hard to understand. Betruger then explains to the crew about the gates. It is a large, stone-like slab with a Sumerian inscription carved into the stones. These gates allow one to travel from one point to another, like teleportation. Betruger adds that aside from what they found on Phobos and Nevada, they believe that there are more gates scattered around in the universe. Hearing all of this, Joan asks if everything that has happened is the result of them activating the gates. But Betruger insists that he doesn't know, saying that he blacks out after going through the gate. At this time, Veronica and Glover speak up and say they see the alien that turns their co-workers into zombies. Veronica describes them as monsters, while Glover says they're demons that are made of fire. Hearing this, Betruger calls him ridiculous and says everything was just a setback. This offends the crew because they already lost four members. Due to that, despite Betruger's protest, they all go back to the NOLA. Arriving at the extension bridge, Joan goes first and orders Winslow, Rance, and Carly to keep watch. On the ship, Joan orders Veronica to take Betruger to the stateroom and gives her instructions on how to go there. Glover is then accompanied by Harry to get some water. Joan immediately looks for Morgan, but only finds him dead on the deck. Then, she gets attacked by the aliens, but manages to evade their attacks, even the fireballs. However, unlike her, Harry doesn't manage to survive as the alien attacks him from behind. Glover is next to be attacked, and all it takes is one strike to take him down. 
Hearing the commotion at the ship, Rance is about to go and check on them when he's suddenly grabbed upwards, and to the other's horror, his guts ran down the ladder before his body drops on the floor. The alien then goes down to attack them and easily takes down Bennett and Carly. Seeing this, Winslow immediately runs off to save himself. In the meantime, Joan searches the ship for her crew and finds Harry dead. When she's about to check on Glover's pulse, she gets interrupted by Veronica. Seeing Glover's condition, Veronica starts panicking and Joan quickly calms her down. Then, she orders her to go back to Bertruger and to not leave unless she says so. Just seconds later, Joan gets attacked by the alien again. But this time, it manages to catch her and tries to suck the life out of her and turns her into a zombie. Meanwhile, Joan sees a vision of her late mother and a very strange place. Fortunately for her, Glover, who turns out to be alive, comes to her rescue, distracting the alien long enough for her to get back on foot. However, Glover takes a direct hit from a fireball and dies. At the same time, Carly is now looking for Winslow, pissed that the man just left her. Unexpectedly, the alien charges at her, but Winslow comes back and the two of them kill the alien. After that, they go back to the extension bridge and find unconscious Bennett there. As the situation calms down, the remaining survivors gather on the NOLA to plan their next move. With the ship's flight deck destroyed and no power to send out distress signals, Bertruger suggests activating the gates and teleporting to Earth. At first, the Marines don't want to risk it, but according to Bennett, they only got 30 minutes before the meltdown happens and have no other choice but to follow Betruger's plan. When the others are gone to prepare for their travel to the reactor room, Bennett says it's too risky to use the gates. This is when Joan reveals that she only agrees so Betruger will not pester her with the gates anymore. What they will do is once the power is back, they will send a distress signal and wait for help to come. As if the favor is on their side, they reach the reactor room without a problem. But as soon as Bennett finishes bringing back the power, Betruger suddenly kills Veronica. Betruger turns out to remember everything that happened since he walked through the gates and is now working for the aliens. Seeing what happened, Bennett attends to Veronica while Joan runs after Betruger. But the traitor already locks them inside the room. Worse still, aliens appear and they manage to kill Winslow and Carly. After Joan takes out all of them, the dying Veronica calls her and gives her the keycard to the lab where Phobos Gate is. Together with Bennett, the two of them go to stop him. At this moment, they come across a special armory room. Using the keycard of the first dead body they found earlier, Joan gets the plasma gun and bomb stored inside. Upon reaching the elevator to the lab, an alien grabs Bennett inside as soon as the door opens and takes him to the lab. Joan tries to help, but she's distracted by two zombies and an alien, which she easily takes out using the plasma gun. She immediately hops on the elevator and finds the lab full of dead bodies. Meanwhile, Betruger is just casually starting the procedure to activate the gates. Joan orders him to step away from the controls, but he just orders zombie Bennett to attack her. At first, she's still trying to call out for Bennett, but when she realizes that it's too late for him, she ends his suffering. When Joan is distracted, Betruger takes the opportunity to strike from behind and steals Joan's gun. However, she manages to get it back and doesn't waste time shooting Betruger. Yet he's still alive. Unbuttoning his shirt, Betruger reveals that the overlord of the aliens already took his heart and reborn him as its servant. Using his telekinetic ability, he pushes Joan into the gates. Afterward, Joan finds herself in the waters. As she swims to the surface, Joan realizes that she's in a different world, noticing a structure that she remembers seeing from her vision earlier. At this time, the overlord named Stanga shows himself and telepathically pushes Joan, making her drop the plasma gun. He then reveals to her that they will reclaim Earth and kill humanity, calling the species a plague of the universe. As the aliens start charging at Joan, she quickly picks up the plasma gun and shoots Stanga. After that, she runs to a portal she sees and throws two plasma grenades at the aliens before jumping into it. To her surprise, Joan lands in front of Khan, 
who's wondering why she comes out of the gates instead of Betruger. When she confirms that she's back on Earth, Joan alerts everyone that they need to close the gate right away. Thinking that the teleportation makes her delusional, they don't mind what she is saying and inject sedatives to make her weak and sleepy. The movie ends with the gates reactivating and Khan thinking that it's Petruger until they hear a loud growl. With a very predictable plot and a little nod to the game Doom, where it is based, Doom Annihilation is a mediocre attempt to translate a video game into a movie. But if you can forget about its connection to Doom and focus on the film itself, then one might find this as a fun zombie and alien two-in-one movie.